Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Rare Petro Podcast. Now this will be the first episode of a new educational series that we're trying to launch, where we will consult with many different experts and different technical disciplines. So you'll hear about topics covering production, completions, drilling, just general education, you name it. We want to get the experts in here to give you the technical knowledge and answers to your questions. Fortunately, this first episode revolves around something that I myself am a little bit more familiar with, so I'll be talking about it along with one of our other associates here at Rare Petro, Colin Fitzgerald. But moving down the road, you won't be hearing so much from me because, well, let's face it, some people have more experience than I even have years alive on this earth, and we want to get those experts on this show. So if you're watching on YouTube, good to see you, and thanks. Go ahead and subscribe because there's going to be plenty of visuals to enhance your understanding, but if you're just listening in the car or in the office to just the audio version of the podcast, well, then I'm sure you will learn something from that too. But without further delay, I think it's time we get into the topic of this podcast, peak oil. Now, when I say that, of course, I'm not talking about producing from high up on a mountain, but more the concept of reaching a maximum rate of production before eventually declining as we fully exhaust existing reserves or transition to other technologies. For example, if you're trying to do your own research on peak oil, you may find this page on Bloomberg. Pretty shocking, huh? My problem with this page is the use of the word suddenly. It's pretty misleading because it implies that we finally reached a point to be concerned about oil after years of gluttonous consumption. That's not the case. People have been worried about exhausting oil supplies ever since we found out how to refine the stuff. Consider Victor C. Alderson, the man who inspired the name for the Alderson Hall on the Colorado School of Mines campus. He was president of the school for his first term in 1903 and then second again in 1917. In 1921, or exactly 100 years from when this video was being recorded, he wrote this statement in an issue of Mines Quarterly. The average middle-aged man of today will live to see the virtual exhaustion of the world's supply of oil from wells. Now, excuse my morbidity, but the average middle-aged man from 100 years ago is likely not alive today, yet we continue to produce oil at even greater rates than we did way back when. All I'm trying to highlight here is the idea of peak oil is not a new one, like the Bloomberg article might lead you to believe. If we jump forward to the year 1940s, we encounter a famous geologist and geophysicist known as Marion King Hubbard, but most people just call him King Hubbard. He was instrumental in demonstrating that rock and Earth's crust could be modeled as a plastic, predicting migration paths and his prediction of peak oil and gas production. Here, you can see him in an interview explaining his chart that predicts peak oil, an idea he originally suggested in 1956. As you can see, he predicted by 2000, we would hit peak oil at roughly 12 billion barrels produced every year before you start a slow decline over the following 100 years. It is a sound mathematical theory, but as I'm sure you can tell, oil production didn't exactly slow in that time. Here's a more modern graph showing peak oil production, and that peak, well, keeps getting lifted. How is this possible? Well, one, technology got better and better, and two, more resources actually turned into reserves as it was now economically profitable to extract some of these previously unreachable materials. Each time we discover a better way to extract the oil, the new peak continues to get shifted up and over, just like we saw in that modern figure. While Hubbard may have been incorrect, I believe he had a good reason to predict what he did, and I think the model will fit a bell-shaped curve later, but I think that's much further into the future. I'm sure by this point, some of you are wondering about the modern claims of peak oil. With more and more push to incorporate renewable energy sources into our everyday lives, surely oil doesn't stand a chance. Well, that's only from a perspective of energy, and let's assume that the entire world stops using fossil fuels for energy tomorrow. I'd like to bring in my good friend and fellow Rare Petro associate, Colin Fitzgerald, to talk exactly about this subject. All right, so Colin, couple questions for you. If we stopped using oil for energy and fuel overnight, would there still be a demand for it? Well, yeah, no, I mean, if we think about it, if we're kind of gonna fly from literally LA to New York, we, we aren't going to be able to get there on solar. We aren't going to be able to get there on wind. So you're going to have to have some kind of fuel source. We're not going to do nuclear. So you're going to have to at least have oil and gas for that. What about plastics? What about other synthetics? So you got to love what Chris Wright was doing over with Liberty Resources, talking to North Face. I mean, all of their products, there's some type of hydrocarbon that's based in their materials for all synthetics. So... You're not going to be able to overnight just get rid of this. 
And the, the market can't withstand that. Plus, if we start looking at the growing third countries, the, the growing markets there, they're, they're emerging. They're going to need some other fuel source. They, they, yes, typically they've been having lumber or coal, but they're going to have to go to some other source like natural gas or oil to keep getting on and get elect, electricity generation. I think you summarized those perfectly. Some of the three biggest points, right? Torque, if we need to power jet engines and machinery to actually harvest these resources. Uh, manufacturing perspective, like you said, North Face, a lot of their stuff, almost all synthetic, manufactured from oil in emerging countries. I mean, there's going to be demand for that as well. So my next question, just to be clear, you think there will still be a demand for oil by some of those key benchmarks like 2030, 2050? Oh, God, yes. Uh, <laughs> you'd have to be, you'd have to be, have a shell of a brain to think otherwise. I remember freshman year at Colorado School of Mines talking to Dr. Ramona Graves, and she told us that our grandchildren's grandchildren will still be using oil and gas. You can't get away from it. People always talk about peak oil demand. I get that concept, but that's also, that. that's assuming we're going to have the same demand over. We're going to have Yes, we have wind and solar to take over, but they don't think about the other emerging markets. Yeah, but if you're looking at a third world country, they're, they're trying to get out of poverty. They're going to be using some, if, if they are buying synthetics, they are going to be using oil. If you're going to be trying to power even just a basic plant, you're going to need some kind of generation. Hydro? Sure. Could be not nuclear? Sure. A lot of people are kind of against that. You need to have a good water source for hydro. So you're going to have to use oil and gas. I, I think it would be small-minded if we thought we wouldn't. And then you kind of touched on it already, but definitely something I want to get into. Yeah, there's going to be a demand for oil 2030, 2050, like Graves said, far, far out. But do you think we've hit peak oil? And if not, when do you think we will hit peak oil? Uh, probably 2070. Uh, I don't see why not. I, I, I keep... They said in the 1970s, we're going to hit peak oil. Then they said in like 1990, oh, we're going to hit peak oil. Then like just 10 years ago, oh, we're going to hit peak oil. Yes, that's if we keep the same assumptions, we're going to have the same population. No one puts in population growth. We also are looking at all of our new electronics. There's a lot of energy that's being, that, that that's taken just to power these batteries. Look at all the different storage we're doing on the, the cloud. You can't even see the damn cloud. Look, there's some <laughs> kind of energy for it. Uh, I mean, yes, you're, I, I don't know. I'll never have the right answer. I don't think anybody ever will. And if we don't transition to doing nuclear, then yeah, peak oil demand will probably be a couple more decades at a minimum away. Yeah, hey, I couldn't agree more. And Colin has hit the nail on the head. We don't just rely on oil for fuel. We manufacture with the stuff. I mean, I hate to say it. But you cannot turn sunlight and wind into tennis shoes, cell phones, and food packaging. I'm sure some of you have seen this figure before, but it just shows how much can be done with a little bit of oil. Even most glasses use plastic lenses today. Not only glasses to assist in academics, but I know a few of you out there for certain are college students who have had more than their fair share of fun with some red plastic cups. Oil's usefulness in manufacturing will guarantee our demand for quite some time, and there's nothing wrong with that. We use it to make products that enhance our quality of living. This is something that the Bloomberg article neglects. Remember that big scary, peak oil is suddenly upon us headline. A huge portion of that article actually focuses on using oil as a fuel and neglects to mention that many people won't be able to afford one of these cars that does replace the demand for a hydrocarbon fuel. Sure, we do have some new baseline models like the Ford Maverick with very limited function and usability at $20,000 for base model, but other affordable VW ID4 and Ford Mustang Mach E will cost you roughly 40k. So we've gone from 20 to 40 already. Other cars like the Lucid Air, Rivian R1T, and GM Hummer start closer to $70,000 at base, but can be configured to over $100,000. I don't know about you folks listening to this podcast, but I'm a young guy who hasn't been out of college long enough, and I couldn't afford one of these Tesla Cybertrucks even if I wanted one. I can confidently say it will take at least several more years before we see a significant number of these vehicles on the road. Something else worth mentioning is that there is a lack of publicly available charging ports, so when plugging your vehicle into the garage outlet to charge, you are likely charging that vehicle with hydrocarbons. While we talk about some of the things that promote the potential of peak oil, let's talk about renewable energy. 
The idea for many is that the use of solar and wind power will offset our use of hydrocarbons so that we can phase out of fossil fuels in the future. Right now, infrastructure is kind of lacking in the United States, and that is something even President Biden has tried to target with a few of his infrastructure bills. The cost of transition is not going to be cheap, and even some estimates predict on the low end it could cost about $15 trillion. Higher end predictions are closer to about $40 trillion. When we do pour that money in, what does it mean for oil and gas? Well, lots of minerals still need to be mined so that we can continue to build all of this renewable technology. I'm talking the solar panels, wind turbines, and hydro turbines. And those minerals will be mined and transported by machines running off of oil and gas. The factories refining those minerals and manufacturing the tech will be powered mostly by oil and gas. The construction crews prepping EV parking lots will move a lot of earth and build infrastructure using oil and gas. Even if we wean off of our use at one point in the supply chain, it still exists in another. I know that eventually this won't be the case, and we will have battery-operated machines that will be charged with the wind and the sun, but unfortunately, we are quite a ways out from that being a viable reality. We've considered the past, present, and future of peak oil, and determined that there's still time for use within the United States. What of the rest of the world? There are millions, even billions of people living in developing parts of the globe, and the idea of renewable energy may not be enough to bring everyone in their population to a level of comfort observed in the United States. If we have cheap and affordable energy and it can allow others to live well, what is to stop other parts of the world from producing oil to export to those countries? Nothing really. The rest of the world wants to have a refrigerator in their house along with a thermostat, and all of that requires a good deal of energy that apparently the US does not want to supply. Everything comes down to this. The theory of peak oil is legitimate, but too many variables keep changing. Any resource use will exhibit a peak use bell curve in some shape or form eventually, if it hasn't already. The early adopters make up a minority, and the majority of people use it in the middle of its life cycle, at the peak of its popularity, and then fewer people use it as a new alternative is found. And the life cycle will repeat with that new material. The question with peak oil is not really if, but rather when. Fortunately for us users of hydrocarbons, it seems like it will not be for a long, long time. There are trillions of barrels of oil and underground oceans of natural gas, and that's only from what we have explored so far. So much of this world hasn't even been explored yet, and that includes its subsurface. We have loads of oil, and it's cost-effective. Usually things with those two traits stay around for quite some time. We likely haven't hit the peak yet, so that means that there will be demand for at least a few more decades to come. I'd like to play you a short clip from an old oil and gas minister of Byron. He tells a story of a man visiting a sultan with his donkey. And he came on a donkey. Mm -hmm. So the sultan asked him in front of everybody, can you make the donkey speak? He said, yes, I can make the donkey speak. He said, you're, you're telling lies to the sultan. He said, I'm not telling lies. He said, how? He said, look, if you uh, don't, uh, if the donkey doesn't speak, I'll cut your head. He said, fine, give me gold now. And in 10 years, I'll come back with the donkey, and he will be speaking. If he doesn't speak, cut my head. So he walked out with the donkey and the gold. And people said, you are crazy. How can you make the donkey talk? He said, in 10 years, either the sultan has died, or I died, or the donkey has died. There are just too many unknowns. Instead of a main character dying, the industry can develop a new method of extraction that allows more oil to be produced economically. The truth of the matter is that no one knows when peak oil is coming, and there's reason to believe that more of the world will need more energy in the future. This has been Tavis Killian and also Colin Fitzgerald with Rare Petro. Thank you for your time. <laughs>